Opening statement, how we begin. Um, now, I was told uh, that Mike and I don't actually disagree very much. I, mean, I defend the gold theory. Mike defends what's called desire utilitarianism. But the, what I've argued is that gold theory is nothing more than desire utilitarianism taken to its logical conclusion. On gold theory, all morality aims ultimately at one central goal. And if you identify that goal, then moral facts become simply a matter of empirically discovering what best achieves that goal. Uh, and I have argued that that goal is happiness. Now, I do not mean this in the classic utilitarian sense, uh, that the goal of morality is the happiness of others, such as the greatest happiness for the most people. But I mean it in the egoistic sense, that the goal of morality is the happiness of the moral agent herself. And this is what we'll be debating today. Uh, to make my case, I have to define a lot of terms and set up the premises of my argument. Uh, first, we must define morality. I'll be using the broadest definition, uh, that morality is that which we ought most to do. In other words, that which we ought to do above all else. I affirm that this is a universally agreed definition, even by people who don't realize they are using it. It is an actual practice what everyone really means by morality, even if they're not aware of the fact. Next, we must define desire. Uh, there are two ways to define this. There's a scientific definition, which addresses the actual phenomenology and mechanism, uh, the mechanics of mammalian brains, mammalian desires. And then there's an analytic definition, which is more general and describes all possible desires of all possible species of any kind, including even hypothetically the desires of you know, hypothetical emotionless androids, let's say. Uh, the scientific definition reduces to this. A desire is a state of discomfort which is relieved by achieving the object of desire. We are therefore driven to pursue the things we want by a state of dissatisfaction, and we call that state a desire. It feels a certain way, it comes in different degrees, it even comes and goes. Uh, for example, there are desires we have but don't feel because we are occupied by something else. And I could even go into further detail about the biochemistry involved, the phenomenology involved, and so on. But that's all just the machinery that our brains just happen to use in order to realize a more fundamental and universal kind of computation. And it's that computation that I'm really concerned with. And it can be defined analytically as to desire a thing is simply to prefer that thing to something else instead. Uh, in other words, to prefer having it to not having it. And that's the fundamental analytical definition of a desire. And this could be manifested by any phenomenology, any mechanism. Even desktop computers have desires in this sense, in the same way ants do, or lizards, or mice. They just aren't conscious of it, and their computational abilities are vastly less than ours. But the basic idea of desiring as preferring, and of preferring as choosing, is the same. I'll also be affirming a particular theory of motivation, uh, that you always do what you most want. Uh, even when you say, I don't want to do this, but I have to, so I'm going to do it anyway, that's not exactly really what's going on. Because if you really didn't want to do it, you wouldn't do it at all. Uh, the only reason you are doing it is that your desire to do it was greater than your desire not to. Uh, in the sense of desire, in the sense of the term desire I'm using, it would be logically impossible for any other result to occur, other than a mad scientist moving your body like a puppet. But we're talking about your own actual choices here, where, so that scenario isn't relevant. So when you say, I don't want to do this, but you're going to do it anyway, you really just mean that you have a desire not to do it, not that that desire is your strongest desire, however. Your strongest desire is obviously, nevertheless, to do it anyway. So, for example, exercising to stay fit. Now, you might not feel like exercising, but you desire to get fit. And you know you can't get fit unless you stick to your exercise schedule. And when you make this desire present in your mind, then it becomes the stronger desire, and thus then overrides the other. Now, the strange phenomenology of this is a peculiar artifact of our badly designed mammalian brains, and has nothing to do with any universal truth of the matter. The actual truth is simply that we want to get fit, because that's what we conclude when we rationally think about what we really want. And for a really good philosophical analysis of this phenomenology and, and, uh, and de of desire and the complexities of it, I highly recommend reading Neil Sin Hibabu's 2009 paper in Philosophical Review. It's really excellent. Anyway, this, this strange, flawed phenomenology of mammalian desire computation results in the fact that we often have two sets of desires. We, our actual desires and our present desires. And they don't always align. I mean, what we happen to want at any given moment, to sleep in, for example, is not what we really want most. Uh, such as to get to work on time and keep our jobs so we can get paid and meet all our other desires with the resulting income. A straightforward, correctly designed computer would never have this problem. Uh, its present desires would always be its actual desires, but we aren't designed that well. So we need a technology, kind of like a software patch, that fixes our broken computation routines and makes us run correctly. Uh, one of those technologies is morality. Uh, others, by the way, are logic, science, and mathematics, which we also invented and used to correct various other errors of computation in our badly designed brains. So when I speak about our desires and our greatest desire, I'm not going to mean our present desires in any given moment, but
but our actual desires, what we would actually desire and desire most if we were reasoning logically and aware of all we needed to know to make a sound decision. In other words, our desires as they would be if we were rational and informed. Now, if it comes up, I can prove that we all want most, above all things, to be rational and informed when we make decisions. Uh, ironically, even when we really want to make irrational or uninformed decisions, such as when we're playing a game, we still want to be sure that we are rational and informed when we choose when to do that and when not to. Uh, we all want to be sure we can tell the difference between a game and reality because our decisions and their consequences will be very different in each. So even then, we all still want to be sure we are rational and informed when we are making our root decisions. So whether we realize it or not, we all want that. But I assume that's not going to be in dispute today. A rational and informed person will know there are things they don't know and would like to know about most of the decisions they make. Accordingly, they will desire to learn things first, and thus, well, they will do so. And the truths of the world will often be different from what we know. Uh, thus, when we are making decisions, we want those decisions to be aligned with reality as it is, not necessarily as we think it is, because how we think it is might be wrong, and we're aware of this fact. So, for example, when you're deciding whether to marry your boyfriend, you certainly want to know whether he is cheating on you and planning to rob your bank account and run off with his lover. Uh, if that is what's actually happening, the best decision would be to not marry them, even if you don't know it at the time. So even your actual desires can be wrong, too. And therefore, we can say things about what your actual desires would be if you were fully informed. For example, your actual greatest desire might be to marry this man, but when fully informed, your actual greatest desire would be to not marry him. And because of this, there are also lots of occasions where we trust that others know better than we do. For example, when you are visiting a naval ship, you would want to follow all the safety directions posted everywhere, even though you won't necessarily know why. But you do know the people who developed and posted those instructions, and they know why, and almost certainly have very good reasons, so you trust them. And even when you don't trust them, you can inquire and find out the reasons and confirm and th their validity yourself. Morality is like that. It's a system of instructions for how to live, as determined by people in the know whom you trust, because you have analyzed their methods and know them to be rational and sound. For us atheists, that means derived from ample evidence in a logically valid way, and not blindly trusting some idiot who claims God speaks to him somehow when we can't even vet the reliability of that idiot, much less this godfellow he's supposed to be uh, speaking to. But as atheists, we don't have to trust blindly either, because we can verify the soundness and validity of an evidence-based morality ourselves the same way we do any scientific fact, without having to redo all the science ourselves. We don't have to be cosmologists to verify that there's sound, valid reasons to believe certain facts in cosmology, for example. Morality would operate the same way. In short, we know that if we knew all the facts, the behavior recommended by a sound and valid moral system would be what we would most desire to emulate ourselves, because we know that will work out best for ourselves. So we do have the actual desire to follow that morality, and when we are acting rationally, that actual desire will become our present desire. Now, I'm not going to explain now how all morality, even the morality advocated by Immanuel Kant, even the morality advocated by Christian evangelists, all of all moralities actually reduce to nothing more than this, plus a system of hypothetical imperatives and thus reduces ultimately to propositions about what we desire. Now, a hypothetical imperative is any statement like, if you want a certain outcome, then you ought to behave a certain way. So the truth of hypothetical imperatives derives from what you want, your desires. And morality is just a bunch of hypothetical imperatives like this. So morality derives from your desires. Now, I assume Mike already agrees with me on that. Uh, I think that's probably the case. And if not, we can address it in follow-up. I'm also not going to discuss how specific moral facts derive from this analysis, such as that we ought to be reasonably honest and reasonably compassionate, unless again it comes up. But I've already presented that analysis in my book, Sense and Goodness Without God, but if it comes up again, we'll, we'll, we'll hash it out. But basically, if morality is what you ought to do above all else, then moral facts necessarily follow from what you desire above all else. Because what you desire above all else will, by its very definition, override all other desires. Therefore, choices motivated by that desire will override all other choices. And that is, by universal definition, what moral facts are, choices that override all other choices, and ought to do so. And these moral facts do not follow simply from what our greatest actual desire is, but from what our greatest actual desire would be if we were fully informed and rational. And this makes moral facts into empirically discoverable scientific facts, since what we actually want and what actually best achieves that are both scientifically discoverable empirical facts of the world. But that isn't what we're going to debate today. It's just the background that sets up what I'm talking about. What we're debating today is whether this actual greatest desire, from which all moral facts are thus entailed, is our desire to be happy. Uh, I believe that conclusion was established already, to an extent, by Aristotle, 
Uh, Aristotle defined happiness in a particular way. He called it eudaimonia, a feeling that all is right with yourself in the world, a state of contentment or higher bliss, which was more desirable than mere pleasure or joy or anything else you might define happiness as. But he was hung up on that peculiar phenomenology and mechanics of the, the mammalian brain again. Uh, I'm going beyond that to the more fundamental, the more universal truth of the matter which is that the happiness state Aristotle was trying to describe is what I shall more generically call a state of satisfaction. Aristotle's argument went something like this. All desires have a reason. We don't just desire things for no reason. Most things we desire, we desire because we desire something else that is achieved by it. You can pick any desire and ask, what you, ask why you want that, or why you should bother wanting it, what's the point of wanting it. And you'll realize there's a reason to want that thing, a reason to have that desire, you desire it for some particular end, and not just for itself. Otherwise, you wouldn't want it. Now, of course, this can't go on forever. We don't have infinite desire. So there must be something we desire for no reason, uh, possibly many things. But Aristotle argued that there was one ultimate reason that we desire anything at all, and that, it, that, is, that and it is that singular state of satisfaction, that eudaimonia that he was talking about. Now, that, he said, is the only thing you don't desire for some other end, the only thing that you desire solely for itself. When you ask, why do I want to be ultimately satisfied with life? The question is inherently absurd. It's like asking what's north of the North Pole. But there are, of course, different degrees of satisfaction. It can be measured qualitatively. Some states of satisfaction are more desirable than others. And quantitatively, how often and for how long. And the greatest state of satisfaction, that than which no state is more satisfying, would be perfect happiness. But all lesser states of satisfaction are degrees of happiness. And we always aim at getting higher up that ladder or in greater quantities. Now, our greatest goal in everything we do is simply this, the highest state of satisfaction we can obtain for as long or as often as possible. Now, this is not our present desire. It's our actual desire. That is, if we sat down and thought about why we want anything, why we have any desire we do, why we prefer anything to anything else, we will always come around to the same conclusion, because it satisfies us to do so, and it satisfies us more than the alternative. Pick any desire we have that motivates us. In fact, pick any greatest desire we have, and again, I mean an actual desire, not a merely present desire, and ask, why should I want that, uh, rather than something else instead? The reason will always be some reference to that state of satisfaction we will obtain by realizing that desire. And sometimes even by merely having that desire. The having of the desire can be satisfying in and of itself. Thus, our ultimate goal is that satisfaction state. Uh, all desires are pursued for that end. Therefore, there is uh, but therefore, that is our greatest desire. Therefore, all moral facts de derive from that desire. Ultimately, they come, come down to it. And again, uh, I'll just lay it all out. Uh, this is tying up everything I've just pointed out. Uh, because moral imperatives are imperatives that supersede all other imperatives, and because moral facts are all hypothetical imperatives, and hypothetical imperatives are true in virtue of desires, our desires, Therefore, imperatives that supersede all other imperatives will derive from desires that supersede all other desires. And as the desire for greater satisfaction, which we colloquially describe as different states of happiness, that desire for greater satisfaction supersedes all other desires, because it's the thing that we desire anything for, because it is the only reason to have any desire at all. Therefore, that state of satisfaction is and must be the singular goal of morality. Uh, and that's how much time do I have left? Because I think a minute and a half. I'm going to end there. Then. Mm -hmm.